at roughly 8 30 p.m eastern at the td garden on march the 3rd this jalen brown layup followed by an and one on the next possession saw the celtics up by 28 against the brooklyn nets on national tv yes once again a howler by espn and their scheduling to place on their large platform an absolute demolition according to espn analytics the current scoreline of 51 23 saw Boston's win probability sit at 99.3%. With Jalen Brown, Jason Tatum at their disposal, amongst others who have stood up all year, playing a Nets team who have since the All-Star break lost to the Bulls by over 40 and conceded 142 to the Knicks. The Nets winning the game from this position could be considered impossible. The Nets took this to heart, and so in the 31 minutes that followed, the Nets outscored Boston 92-54, out-hustled them on defense, and saw incredible, well-rounded contributions across the board, especially from their four trade acquisitions, which fans have been crying out for, especially in recent memory. The biggest comeback of the season by any team, this is how the Nets did the impossible on national TV. I want to put it down to a number of things, the most blatantly obvious being defense. The Celtics offense felt disjointed, our help defense was better, the rotations were better, this of course in comparison to what was on display in the first half. Boston had a lot more isolation possessions as the buckets started to flow for us. We talk about the ripple effect in basketball a lot. You get a stop, you can go up the other end and expose an, an unset half-court defensive scheme. That happens, and now you can back your own defense to deliver, especially if the Celtics can't run with pace and stops become easier. A team this locked in down the stretch meant that everything trickled through and just repeated itself over and over and over again. The next thing is specifically Mikel Bridges. This guy was insanely good. I mean, I've gone through his 45-point game against Miami on the channel, but this was eerily similar. One element that was fairly underrated about this game, Mikel's contributions were insanely valuable early on. He had 16 of our first 36 points, and had it not been for him keeping us afloat, this game could have been lost much, much earlier. Now, we've talked about Mikel's IQ on this channel before, this play really encapsulates that really well. So you can see that they've set up a sort of zone setup. You can see that what Seth Curry is about to do is set a screen here for Al Horford. I don't even know if I've drawn that right. But Spencer Dinwiddie has been a little bit of a problem. You can see that the mismatch is there and obviously Horford may need a little bit of help at his very old age. But what Mikel does, Jalen Brown needs to, you know, hold Spencer accountable because I think it's going to be pretty clear that Boston are going to try switch this. And as the play runs, you can see that Seth Curry has set the screen on Horford and Jalen Brown's come over to help. But the thing is that Mikel Bridges has made this excellent run to the corner here, right? And what that's going to do is, well, you can see that Jalen Brown clearly isn't accountable for Mikel. And so if I let the play run, you can see that Robert Williams has got a shit ton of space to close out. So he's going to be late to that. And Mikel exploits this by simply blowing right by. And you can see that there's no reinforcement under the basket and an easy layup for him. That's simply a byproduct of Mikel knowing where the space is and knowing that there's an opportunity because simply put, zone defense is going to have these little holes in in you know the, the defensive structure we have seen this play time and time again where simply put mccall will come up to receive the handoff from here and cam johnson will run the other way and you can see it coming to life here mccall now is going to whip right around and go through the middle and you can see that's basically how he gets half of his mid-range jump shots Interestingly enough, they did a modified version of this about a minute later where Cam Johnson's letting go of the ball about here. So it's a much longer pass. And what does this do? Well, it creates a little bit more spacing. So 
Usually when this play pans out, you've got Macal going around the outside because Marcus Smart is probably a little bit more central. When you're covering a simple switch, I mean, if you're more congested, it's going to be e easier to cover space. But we can see here what happens because unlike a normal handoff, Macal's actually got room to get to his spot. Marcus Smart has to pick up Cam Johnson because he's going around the outside um, and thus you need to cover those angles as well. And so because you didn't switch on the initial, now what happens is Marcus Smart is in the corner, isolated on Cam Johnson. So he's instantly out of the play. And now what you're going to see is there is going to be a normal switch between McCall and Spencer, which leaves Sam Hauser as the assignment on McCall. He will let the three-pointer go with a bit more space on a pretty vulnerable defender. And you can see that the shot is knocked down. Up next is Cam Johnson. This was Cam Johnson's first half stats. One of seven from the field, three points, seven minutes, four fouls. The man could not see game time. Watching this game with some of you on the live watch along, I said Thing 2 needed to play the vast majority of the second half for us to win this game. Not only did he play considerably more, he played the entire second half, barring 23 seconds. He did not foul out until the final minute. Scored 17 points on 4 of 9 shooting, and played some incredibly disciplined defense without fouling. Alright, so we've got a very interesting inbounds play. Now what you're going to see, is you're going to see Cam Johnson cut here and fake his movement to the corner. McCall's going to whip around Clax, and Clax is going to cut into the middle. I know that's a lot of arrows for you. But what we're going to do is we're just going to run the play and you can see that Mikel will use that clack screen. And now what this does, because you can see that Jalen Brown now has had to pick up clacks as Horford has tried to pick up Mikel. You can just see over here Horford's taken Mikel and Jalen Brown's actually trailing clack. So that means that Derek White needs to come across and block this run by clax But... The issue with that is Cam Johnson, under all these arrows, is running out back here and Jalen Brown should actually be occupying that instead of, you know, committing to occupying Clax and taking that assignment. So if we play things out, you'll see that Jalen Brown has done the cardinal sin of trying to double Clax in the middle when you've got a shooter wide open on the perimeter who can knock down the three without any form of pressure. What an incredibly mature performance by Cam, a contribution we desperately needed. And on his birthday, he was sharing his gifts with the Nets rather than receiving them. Now the twins were the pioneers of a mindset which got us over the line, attacking the basket. In the earliest stages, attacking the basket hadn't been enough of a priority for this team, opting for low percentage mid ranges or step back threes. But the good thing with the attack is number one, it opened up more fluid in rhythm threes on the kickout, or it opened the opportunity for a blow by to the basket, especially if we had Mascala or Horford guarding the primary ball handler. More open looks and makes had an impact on how we dictated the pace of the game in our favor. Okay, here's a prime example of what happens when you drive the ball. You can see that as we play the footage, you can see one defender, two defenders, three defenders, four defenders are all collapsing in the paint and you might as well have Tatum involved there. And that means that there is some wide open shooters. Now what Spencer is going to do is kick it out to the man, which is Royce. And you can, you will see that Marcus Smart and Jalen Brown, a little bit of miscommunication. Their first instinct is to go over and close that one out. But what we also know is that once they close out, Royce is going to boot it out here to McCall. He could potentially kick it out to Finney Smith with the extra pass yet again. And if we play the footage, you can see exactly what happens. Wide open three and bucket. So here's another example. We've just gotten the rebound. If I play the footage through, you will see that Royce right here is going to gather the ball. Now, Marcus Smart is forced to pick up dfs in the corner there so that means that there is a huge bunker of space right under the basket so royce knowing fully that that is the case is basically just going to 
drive it, and while well, there's no reinforcement to help him out, and he gets the foul plus one. And now you're going to see, once again, another example of what happens when you drive and kick. You can see the screen and switch means that we have Peyton Pritchard guarding McCall, and obviously you're going to try attack that mismatch. And so the play runs, cross, drive, and you can see that Jalen Brown, you know, mccall has been a pretty big issue um, today. Jalen Brown's come over to try help Peyton Pritchard. You can see Horford's under there as well, trying to give some help. But we know that Mikel has been on fire. He kicks that one out, and Jalen Brown is a bit late on the closeout. And so he overcommits, fell for the pump fake, and Seth Curry can go to work and cook that curry. The next thing is Dorian Finney-Smith. The guy was shooting 21%, give or take from three, in the first eight games in a Nets uniform. Defensively, like many others, he'd been subpar. But in this one, his jump shot was consistent, and it was incredibly important. He knocked down the dagger in the last, he was a part of the fight back, and overall, the five three-pointers he made in this game probably were more than he made in the last three games combined. So what I'm about to show you is, is what actually got Finney Smith going. It was a lot of rhythm three-pointers, um, especially early offense, early kind of offense. This is really unforgivable by Boston. Um, but you can see as the play runs, now I'm going to stop it right here. You can see the very top of your screen is Al Horford and Dorian Finney Smith. Now, Royce here is the playmaker in this scenario. And you're probably wondering how on earth is he the playmaker when he doesn't even have the ball. Well, what he's going to do is because Robert Williams is actually trailing this play and he's also a big piece in what goes on here. Royce is going to cut down the middle and that means that Horford's got to, you know, naturally meet him um, to ensure that there's no easy layup. And you can see that if I run the play, you're going to see that because Horford has actually had to, you know, occupy Royce to cover Robert Williams, Dorian Finney-Smith has a crap ton of space, you know, to let a three-pointer go. And, um, well, we know the result. Fuck it. A couple ferocious blocks in there rounded out an incredibly needed performance, not only for the Nets to win this game, but for him to get his confidence back. The last thing is the turnovers. We played the Celtics at their own game they played in the first half. The majority of turnovers Boston committed in the second half were done in the same vulnerable spot of the court we did in the first half. Credit where credit is due. The Nets being incredibly active defensively and much more alert was the catalyst for this. Though some of the turnovers were the same unforced errors that we were also prone to in the first half. A byproduct of a Boston team who seemed pretty lethargic in the second half on both ends. All right, so as we've mentioned earlier in this video, you can probably see by my drawing that this general area is where we turn the ball over the most. And that's pretty bad. And you wanna know why? Because, well, if we compare it to these areas, you know, these areas, it takes much, much longer to, you know, get the ball ahead and break out and transition. So the transition doesn't really pack as much punch as if you turned it over in this area where you can actually go much more direct towards the basket. And thus it's gonna be much more difficult to get back. That's why you don't wanna turn it over there. So if we see the play run, you're gonna see Robert Williams come up for a screen, but I just want you to pay attention to what Spencer does here. He actually does a little bit of a body bump, which holds up Robert Williams, who probably wants to get into this general area, like around here. And Clax, well, we know his arms just go like this, straight up. It's going to be very difficult to get the ball over the top of him, especially if he's smothering. So as the play runs, you can see the ball is turned over in that exact spot that we don't like to turn the ball over in. And you'll be able to see that, you know, the Celtics can't really get back. We actually have a five on two going on, and it's pretty stiff that we weren't actually able to get the bucket. All right, so this little segment here is basically going to combine everything we've talked about in this video, how, you know, each little thing is actually reliant on something else. It's dependent on something else. It's all a ripple effect. We're going to see it in, um, you know, come to life here. So you can see that Royce is going to pick up the ball. It's going to be some early offense, a nice little spin. 
you can see that there was no resistance under the basket. So there's the attacking um, the basket element. And now we're going to be able to set up a wall, a barricade, because the Celtics can't play with pace. You can see the high screen is going to be set by Robert Williams here, but what's going to actually happen is you're going to see that Royce is going to occupy, you know, the space in the middle. His assignment is smart. you got Dorian Finney-Smith, who is picking up Horford, who is situating himself in the corner. And as we played the footage, you can see the IQ by Seth Curry here. He's not known as being a very good defender, but the rotations had really picked up in the second half. You know, we seemed much more alert and on our toes. Royce is allowed to sit in the middle because Seth Curry is going to take Horford. DFS can roll over to Marcus Smart, so everything is covered. And basically, Williams doesn't have that runway to the rim that was probably being allowed in the first half. So you play the footage further, and that means that Dorian Finney-Smith, who has, you know, the assignment of Marcus Smart, if Smart's going to come into the paint, well, that means Dorian can as well. And thus, he's allowed to, you know, pick up that block without really any repercussions um, you know, on the defensive end. And so from here, we can just break out and transition and you can see Boston's, you know, defense isn't really set. It's taken the lowest amount of seconds possible to, you know, go coast to coast. And um, we got a pretty high percentage look here. If it wasn't for a foul, it's going to be a dunk or an easy layup. Um, but yeah, that's basically just showing, you know, how offense helps defense and, and vice versa. I recognize there's probably more things I could sprinkle in there. Sure, Boston missed both Robert Williams for the majority of the second half and Malcolm Brogdon for the entire game. But with the personnel at their disposal, there should be no excuses for a formidable Boston team up 28 on their home floor. As for the Nets, what a fight back and what a victory. A desperately needed win and a win that can lift the confidence in the room and can be a moment worth drawing upon. Should we face a similar situation? Or more generally, to remind ourselves that the game isn't over until it's over. Thanks for tuning in. If you enjoyed, drop a like and subscribe. Have a good one. See you soon. Bye for now.